Hi everyone. Today we're going to be talking about monitoring or recording the didgeridoo and monitoring your recordings so you can listen to them, evaluate them and improve your digital recordings, get better recordings. Um, without decent monitoring system, you know, you're not going to get good recordings, you know, it's, it, otherwise it's, it's complete guesswork is is not really possible um, if you're just recording on your phone and listening back on your phone that's fine you know often recording on the phone will sound fine on a back on a phone but don't expect that recording to sound good on a decent audio system it won't um it won't sound good it will sound quite often it will sound bad you know i'm going to be honest um so if you want it to sound good you need a good monitoring system you need loudspeakers or at least headphones. I mean, some people, if, particularly if they've got a bad sounding room, you know, they can't do the treatment in the room, they'll record on headphones and become used to referencing recordings on their headphones so that they can, so that it'll play back well on another sound system. You know, you, you have to learn to reference it between recording on headphones, it being played back on another sound system. But, uh, Generally, uh, studios have studio monitors in, loudspeakers that are set up properly um, so that you can evaluate recordings, listen back, and then you can, you know, go from there really as to whether it's a good recording or not. Um, so that's really uh, the way to do it. Is, is you first need to get a pair of loudspeakers um, or headphones uh, so if you if you get a pair of loudspeakers or studio monitors, if you're starting off, generally near field monitors are a good way to go. Near field monitors being loudspeakers that are quite close really to you and uh, you know not set back a long way from the listening position. And and you you know you can purchase them from uh, an audio shop you know a professional audio place that sells studio monitors if you if you happen to have a pair of bookshelf hi-fi speakers they're quite good you know you can use them if you want to um nothing to stop you using hi-fi speakers uh, a lot of people in the studio world or some no some people may say it's a no-no to use hi-fi speakers but if it doesn't make any difference if they're a good set of speakers you can use them and in fact over the years um people in studios and mastering engineers have often used good hi-fi speakers so you know the ns10s were originally designed as a, a hi-fi speaker and has been used you know all over the world in lots of studios uh, i think abbey road they use bmw high-end speakers which sort of designed as a hi-fi manufacturing company so so don't worry about that just but it's probably easier if you're going to start off to to uh, just go to an audio place and you'll probably find studio monitors if you haven't got anything already and then you can go with you know there's different brands out there i think krk do some reasonably good well-reviewed speakers i've got some adams there sounding quite good here uh, but anyway, that that's the thing. Get yourself a pair of loudspeakers, um, and uh, then so when I when I was do when I did the microphone videos and I talked about microphone placement into the dig, I described how basically you can EQ the sound before it goes into the door. You know, before you start EQing in there, get the EQ right. In the room first in the in the did we do recording so likewise in monitoring you need to set up your listening spot and the speakers in the right place so that basically you're in the best eq position in the room you've already got the eq sorted in your listening position because uh, otherwise you're going to have all kinds of problems you know it's a uh, particularly in the low bass frequencies or low, low end, you're just going to have a lot of problems otherwise. So generally speaking, uh, in acoustic terms, they suggest that my front wall's that side there, my buck wall's there, facing the long ways down the wall, not the short wall there, you know, across the short distance, the long distance. My front wall's there, and uh, they normally suggest you start off about a third back from the... The front wall so if you split your room up into thirds 
measure back a third, you could put your listening position, your seat there, and then set your speakers up, you know, nearer to the wall or away from the wall a little bit, um, and start from there because they 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 say that's more of the sweet spot in terms of the evenness of frequency. You're going to get less problems um, there. So I mean, with in terms of frequency in room, I mean, you need to know a little bit about frequency because if you're recording dig, you know, you need to know about the lower frequencies and things or problems that can cause. Um, so, so that if you're sitting, say, t a third back from the front wall, you, 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 if you're if you're playing, let's just say you're playing an eighty hertz, a digit eighty hertz or eighty seven hertz, say around around the key of F or something, and you've got you're listening back at eighty seven hertz, you're going to have these these sort of null points where there's where there's no bass say, at eighty or ninety hertz. And then you're going to have peaks where it, there's more bass. And if you move backwards and forwards in the room, these are going to vary as you're move. you know. So where your listening position is, you want to kind of be positioned in an e more even spot where there's not a complete null or there's not a complete peak so that you're not, so that when you're EQing later on, you're not kind of <laughs> compensating and getting that wrong. Because that's the problem. That's That's why... That's why they suggest uh, a third back, roughly, or I think another. Uh, I think it's also said thirty-eight percent is a back from the the front wall. But um, I wouldn't get too caught up being fixed on exact distances. And really, you're better off experimenting with the listening position because that's a guideline. You know, these are just guidelines. Um, and if you stick to them rigidly, you 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 may not find the best spot. So, but it's a good starting point. You could go there if you've got a desk. Put your your, your speakers on a desk, and um, they would be near fields because they're going to be close. So, uh, mine are on stands. I prefer mine on stands. I might prefer mine set back slightly. You can probably see one over there. I, I prefer them on stands because I'm used to listening with my speakers not too close. I prefer them further back. Um, I like that the sound the sound stage I get with that. I prefer that, but I'm so used to it. You've got to remember, I've I've been doing I've been listening for many many years. Before I got into recording, I, I was doing a lot of listening on hi-fi and some a lot of critical listening as well. So I'm quite used to my sound system and knowing where I want to place it. Um, my listening position is actually halfway where it would be considered a null in the room, a bad spot. So you know you have to. That's why you have to be careful of sticking rigidly to guidelines because if i did that I, I wouldn't be here but this is the best listening spot in the room i found so so that's where i'm sitting so there we go um it's good guidelines but be prepared to break them if, if you can find a better spot to listen in and i've i've done a link in the video to um to a guy that set his system up a mastering engineer uh and he, interestingly enough he also ended up in the middle of the room and his speakers in the corner which is another no-no, but um, but it sounded best in his room. So, as I say, experimenting is always the best option, as in with the microphones. Um, you've got the best chance of getting the best sound. So, uh, yeah. Um, when you're setting your speakers up, um, as I say, I'm not going to go into the, the stands and things. A streak, I've linked to a video he describes there about setting it up on stands. So you can check those videos out. But what you will need to do is set it up in a, um, particularly if you are you haven't done this before, um, an equilateral triangle so that the, so that the, um, so that the position, you know, is kind of, you know, a triangle and your ears are in the back of the one at point of the triangle. You'll see this described on the video. Uh, the reason for this is, I mean, uh, just a quick aside here. I mean, not all engineers have it exactly set up like that, but but they've been listening to their systems and referencing their systems in a certain way, and they're so used to it. But for a lot of people, most most systems, I think they're set up in this kind of triangular formation, which helps to give you that stereo sound staging, so that um, you know when you've got two speakers here and your listening spot here. 
you can hear the left and right stereo sound field. And when, when you've got them set up properly, you won't just hear a left and right, you'll also hear a depth. So it becomes 3D. So stereo imaging becomes is more of a 3D thing. The sound field becomes 3D. And that's this whole sound stage, is the whole sound you're hearing. Um, and the sound stage also with the room reflections, you know, um, you know, gives you that sound that that sound stage. If you're not used to these terms, sound stage and stereo imaging, um, you know, it might be useful also to go and listen in somebody's if you can find somebody who's got a system, or even go, you know, go on a day out and go to a studio, see if you could ask if someone would invite you uh, or invite yourself to a studio just to hear what a, a good sound system sounds like, give you an idea, you know, and uh, what stereo imaging is and what the sound staging is because um it's hard to translate that unless you've ever listened to it you know those that have know what i'm talking about so that you know that's straightforward but uh, so yeah so you want to get set up so that your sound staging your your stereo imaging is so you can do critical listening left right and uh, listen to the detail and near field particularly will do that detail fine detail you should be able to get that pretty good and uh, minor setback just I, I prefer a bit more sound a larger slightly larger sound stage because i've got a little bit more room involved so near field monitors really what they're trying to do is take out the room sound as much as possible all the reflections going on in the room because think sound is coming from your speakers bouncing off all the different walls you've got all the high frequencies mid frequencies low frequencies bouncing off all the walls and coming back to your ears and giving you sort of like misperception of what you're hearing to some extent, you know. And there are all kinds of time delays, phase issues and all kinds of things going on. It's quite complex when you think of what's going on in a room. So near fields kind of take away that away a bit, you know, so that if you've got the near fields closer to your ears, um, you're, you've got less room sound in it. Ho hopefully that makes some sense. And... Um, it's so the same as microphone. When you're setting up the dig with the microphone, the closer you have the dig to the microphone, um, the less room you're going to have. But there's always a payoff with that because obviously, as I, I described before, sometimes it's better to set the dig back and get a sound. But So you kind of have to work all that out. But with, with the monitoring, once you've got this set up, once you've got the sound set up, and it's it's quite important to get this accurate, really accurate, because it because then you can really hear what's happening in your dig recordings and you know if you haven't got it set up right you're not going to be able to evaluate the stereo image properly and the detail properly and all the frequencies you're trying to listen to also another thing in my room in this particular room I can do it I've got my left and right speaker set up exactly the same distance away from the left and right wall so that I've got symmetry in the room so that the sound reflections are at the same distance, you know, there's, but but they're a bit lot further away from the rear wall. It's 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 side to side. It's the side to side thing, like from here to here, that the symmet that I've got it symmetrical, um, and that can be quite useful as well if you can do that. I mean, you've got to work within your practical means because, um, you know. We've all got practical limitations in certain rooms. So if you can do that, then try and get it symmetrical. You, they, the, the loudspeakers don't really want to be the same distance from the side wall to the back wall because that, <laughs> that can cause more issues. Um, but certainly from the side, each side wall, if you can get a bit of symmetry in the room, that would be, that would be great. Um, and then, so when it comes to... As I say, you're you're listening to the stereo imaging. If you're recording didgeridoo, let's just say you've got um let's just say you've recorded it in stereo, you know, you've got stereo mics and you've recorded the 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 uh the dig in stereo, you, you you've got that left and right stereo image you want. So you can if you're if you've got your setup right in the room, you'll be able to hear it nicely and accurately, and then you can work with it and get the recordings right. So the thing is with with setting up the listening positions, it's called the sweet spot, by the way. Um, 
where you're listening, the listening position. And it, the, the reason they suggest two thirds is because of particularly the low frequency causes a lot of problems, particularly in small rooms. So if you're if you're two thirds of the way, as I think I mentioned this a minute ago, you, hopefully you've got more of an even bass response there. So and then you can work with that and adjust the EQ. Hopefully, you know, you're in a better position to do the EQing from there, really. Uh, so the other thing is, is because you've got all these room reflections going on in the room, uh, it's, it's, it's better to have some kind of acoustic uh, treatment, you know, to help absorb some of the frequencies. Because when I came into this room, you know, when I first came in, I thought, oh, God, you know, didn't sound very good. <laughs> um, but I got my speaker system set up, no acoustic treatment. I always set mine up uh, without any treatment to start with. I like to listen to the room, hear how it is, hear the speakers in the room. And uh, because if I put my if I put these speakers I've got in a different room, those speakers would sound the same speakers, but the, but it would sound different in a different room. Every room you go in is going to sound different. But like every set of loudspeakers, they all sound different. Um, so when I first got set up in here, it was like, oh, that's not good. <laughs> I mean, I got it set up sounding reasonably OK, but in terms of performance and, you know, recording, it's like, no, that's not, not great. So I, I decided to get some uh, absorbers in the room and um, I made them because... You know, I can't afford necessarily to buy... Uh, acoustic treatment can be very expensive. I mean, studios can spend thousands on acoustic treatment and some studios are designed around the acoustics, you know. They're built, so it can cost mega money, really. So you can get yourself... Uh, you, you can get yourself um, some acoustic treatment. You can either buy it, if you can afford it, or you can... Um, you can make your own. I've made my own uh, broadband absorbers I've made. And what it helps do is even the bass, what well, even all the frequencies out in the room, not just the bass response. The bass response is actually harder to even out in a smaller room. But you can even out the frequencies from top to bottom, you know, from high frequencies to low. So you've got your highs, your higher mids, your high, uh, lower mids, your mids, your lower mids and your lows. And a broadband absorber will absorb a lot of frequencies from top to the lower mids um, in particular. And what you don't want to do is just stick some curtains up at the back of the room or some carpet material or something because it might absorb some high frequencies, but it won't absorb the mids and lower mids. And then what you'll have is an imbalanced room, a sound, an imbalanced sound in the room. So, you know, that really is a bit of a, a waste of time, to be honest. So... You can make your own absorbers if you want. If you if you've got a bit of DIY skill, you know, make yourself some absorption. I've done that here. Those, that I don't know if you can see that one there, that yellow one there, that green one one I got years ago is a diffuser absorber, and the yellow one is um, just a pure broadband absorber, and that that is Nauf Rock uh, Nauf. RS60 basically and I've it's quite a dense material it's ideal for absorbing sort of from high to to lower mids in particular it does quite well so you, you can make yourself some panels if you want to and uh, or get someone to make a few for you it's that way around it um, when you're listening one of the first places to treat really you know if you if to get the sound image is to the first reflection points, which is where, where you look at where my speaker is, you probably can't see that great there, but that speaker there, it bounces off that wall and then into my ear, you know, like uh, almost, you know, it bounces off the wall straight into my ear. So that's what they call the first res reflection point. It's that green panel there. Now, I've actually got a diffuser there. Now, I would have thought a broadband absorber would have worked better there, but it actually turned out I preferred that. So... And I've got the broadband absorber, the yellow one behind it. But normally you'd put broadband absorption at the first reflection point. So, and that just stops, you know, the sound coming from your speaker into your ear. You know, it comes directly from your loudspeaker to your ear. But then if you haven't got a, 
the first reflection point treated, it's going to hit the wall and be delayed slightly and then come to your ear. So you've got some problems, you know, critical listening, that you've got reflected sound coming in fractions of a second afterwards, which is, we don't really want that. So it is a good idea to treat those spots and uh, uh, sort that out, really. Um, so, yeah, you can do that. Um, when it comes to frequencies in a room, if you, if you want to get an idea of what problems you can have, I suggest you put a, a sign, get a sine wave generator, or you can go online and you can get these. Uh, uh, I looked online a while ago. If you don't have a sine wave generator in your door, your digital audio workstation, you can go online and get a tone generator, sine wave generator. It'll, it'll generate a tone, let's just say 100 hertz. You switch on you put in 100 hertz, press the button, and it'll, it'll send a sine wave, a tone, a single tone, pure tone out at, say, 100 hertz. It could be any any hertz. It could be 90, 100, 110, 1 kilohertz, whatever. And then keep your system down low to start with, and then just turn it up a bit enough, you, you, the amplification up enough through your loudspeaker so you can hear it in the room. Then walk around the room. Let's just say you've got it on 100 hertz. Walk around the room and hear how the sound goes down and up or up and down as you walk backwards and forwards. Also, what you can do is say play a lower frequency. Let's just say 80 hertz. Play that tone again and then go around the room and listen to where the, the low frequency builds up. You know, the edges of the walls, the corners, you'll hear the bass building up because bass really builds up. And the boundaries of the room. So, uh, so this is the problem we've got with setting up speakers and getting the EQ right in a room. Is you've got all these room reflections, sound bouncing off walls. The low frequency, particularly in small rooms, is can be tricky. And often, the denser the material we use, um, or the thicker, you know, the broadband absorbers we have, the off better it is to absorb that. But you have to think of practicality in your room and what you can do you know because we can't all stick in, stick in about 150 mil six inch broadband absorbers which are quite thick these are about four inches about 100 millimeters i've made so yeah that's easily easily doable if you want to do it so um if you know um so if you can do that you've, you've got your room sort of set up and you've got the eq position about right for your ears and then if you put some broadband absorption and diffusion, you know, because if you've got all broadband absorption, you might end up having too dead a room. You don't want it like a, an anechoic chamber, which is absolutely dead, which you, you're not going to get near. But, you, you, you know, in that sense, you don't want it too dead. You want a bit, bit of liveliness. I do certainly do. So I use uh, diffuse, diffusion as well. You can get broadband stroke diffuser. So it's got a mix of absorption and diffusion as well. Uh, I'm going to have some diffusion on the back wall there, but um, uh, apart and those ones there as well. But uh, so yeah, you want to get a balance of sound really, and then you want to listen to the sound, get some reference tracks. Um, you know, there can be as as you're a dig player, you could use didgeridoo reference tracks, and you can get some other music as well if you just want to get some good see how sound is sounding from your loudspeaker monitoring system. You can. If you want to listen to some reference dig tracks, I mean, you could get, you could say you some of Ash Dargan's recordings. I mean, he's the engineer who recorded his Nigel Pegram uh, has got some top quality recordings, you know, from top to bottom, you know, good, good low end, mid, mid and high. Uh, and you can listen to that as a reference if you want to, but make sure you use the WAV or the lossless file because you don't want to be listening on an MP3 three file, which isn't as good quality. You need the top quality. You could also get some reference tracks if you wanted through some somewhere like Tidal because they use high quality lossless files. So you need to make sure um, Spotify don't think you use lossless. So I'm not sure that that would be good enough, really. So, yeah, make sure you've got reference material. And then you can, when you've got your dig recordings, you can evaluate them against the, the sound of the digital doing some of the recordings. You know, even if it's not the same style, you can get an idea of 
whether or not the, um, you know, whether or not you're anywhere near close to that. Um, so what else can we, what else can I mention here? So yeah, uh, or the other thing is, so the recording quality, you know, to get a good quality recording, you need to be able to reference your stuff you're recording. Getting used to the sound of your system, learning the sound of your system, you know, getting really used to it and familiar with it. And then if you do recordings, learn or, or, or find a way of being able to get them referenced in, in another system. Because when you come to do your recordings, particularly if you go down the pro recording route, you're going to be presenting them to the consumer who've got probably good hi-fi systems out there. Not all of them, but you know some are going to have good hi-fis. And if you haven't recorded well, it's not going to sound good. The better the sound system it goes on, if you have a poor recording, the worse it's going to sound. You know, that's 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 the good thing about having a good studio monitor system. If you've got a poor recording, it's going to show it up that it's really poor. So then you have to, you're forced then to get a good record, you know, to improve it and get a good recording. And by listening to your system set up and then finding a way of being able to go on different systems, you know, maybe find friends or, or find a way of getting your sound into different systems, listen to it. You could go to a studio or maybe go to somewhere where they've got a good hi-fi system and listen to your track and think, ah, oh, it sounds a bit different there, you know. And by that way, you can hear what's happening with your recording setup and how it's translating on other people's systems, which is hence referencing your sound to other sound systems. Um, what else is there to talk about? Uh, I think that uh, that's the main thing. Um, one one thing I don't know yeah to mention is when you're actually recording Dig on your microphone, make sure that you don't have your loudspeakers on and monitoring directly as you're recording because that'll go back into your microphone. Uh, you can use headphones for that. You know, closed back headphones will remove any sound coming back out back into your head your microphone so keep that in mind um, unless you want to do it for creative purposes but generally speaking if you want to monitor your dig you can use headphones or you can just you don't have to use anything if you don't want you can just play record and then play back through your system so so yeah that's that's the thing is getting your sound set up get the stereo imaging right learning how to reference your sound system and um, uh, and understanding that the room has a huge impact in the bass frequencies there are vid videos out there as well that describe more about this you know acoustic stuff in the what's going on in the room there are other programs out there that you you can get like room eq wizard that can you can you can actually um play tone you know you can actually put it through this room eq wizard and work out you know the acoustic sound of your room you know you can get uh readings uh, plot graphs and things that will show you what's going on uh, and there are other programs out there as well but I think first thing is just mainly you need a sound system that was uh, studio monitoring that will help you improve your dig recordings because without it you know you can't you you won't get there so and then you can go on to pro recordings music production recordings which were some really good ones out there did we do recordings on music production side um, can't think of anything else. I think that's about it for the day. Uh, anyway, so hopefully that's something and uh, hope you learned something from that and it just gives you a little bit of an idea as what's required really to get good recordings. Monitoring is really important. Listening is really important. So a bit of a follow up to the microphone uh, record, you know, microphone videos. Anyway, good luck with that and, you know, uh, I hope, hope you can get it set up and get some good recordings for the future. That, that's it for the day.